to you about physical access and assistive technology to support mobility. Over the next half hour or so, we're going to talk about a variety of ways to make the built environment more accessible to people with disabilities, as well as specific technologies to help people get from point A to point B. And um, I'm hoping that this can be an interactive presentation. So if you have questions while I'm talking, please type them into the chat box. And um, Naomi, will you be able to, to monitor the chat? Okay, I'm gonna assume that she will. If no one answers the chat, just turn on your microphone and uh, just go ahead and ask your questions. And then we'll also leave some time at the end uh, for additional questions. So I'm gonna share my screen. And we will get started. Make sure I'm sharing my sound. Okay. All right. And get this going here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So today we're going to talk about physical access and assistive technology for mobility. Uh, first of all, there's going to be uh, some upcoming webinars that I'm going to be giving over the course of the next uh, five or six months. The dates haven't been set yet, but um, check in on the ATAC website for, for dates. The first one is Technologia de Ascendencia. And uh, forgive my pronunciation, but it's going to be an introduction to assistive technology for Spanish language speakers. This workshop will be in uh, English and Spanish. Um, the next topic will be an overview of eye gaze technology. The next one will be alternate pencils for struggling writers. Uh, then we'll have a roundtable discussion on favorite augmentative communication iPad apps. That's going to be a roundtable with speech language pathologists and assistive technology specialists. And uh, the last uh, topic uh, for the next couple months will be assistive technology for supporting keyboarding. And you can access the recording of today's webinar as well as past assistive technology webinars on ATAC's YouTube channel. <clears throat> and here's the link to it. Um, and I believe that um, Naomi shared the link uh, to this um, Google Slides presentation. So you should uh, have so you should have all the live links. But if not, um, we can uh, we can put those in the chat for you. So a little bit about myself, I'm an assistive technology consultant uh, based in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is northern New Jersey. Uh, I cover northern central uh, New Jersey mostly and also the New York City area. I provide services to children and adults with disabilities, including evaluations, training for students, staff, families, ongoing support, webinars and workshops, modifications and customizations. I also do uh, virtual or remote services uh, anywhere that has internet access. And uh, I'm offering free 30 minute assistive technology consultations for anyone with a disability or their family members or support teams. And that's done over the phone by Zoom, Meet, FaceTime, Duo, uh, haven't tried smoke signals yet, but um, they're a remote consultation. If you would like to set up a, a free 30 minute session, please send me an email at adam at adamcraftsconsulting.com 
or call me at 201-618-2315. Uh, this does have to be scheduled, but I'm offering it to, to anyone. So today we're gonna to talk about physical access to homes and public spaces and AT supports for mobility. So the focus for today is, is going to be mostly on people with physical disabilities or people with mobility uh, limitations. So just a little bit of background in assistive technology. When you're talking about assistive technology, you're generally talking about a matching process where you're trying to match the individual um, and the technology. You're trying to match them up so it's a good fit. And you also want it to be a good fit with the environment where the individual is having difficulty doing that task and the task itself. And the set framework created by the uh, late Joy Zabala is an excellent way to do the right steps in the right order. So you always start with the individual, understand them as, as well as you can, their strengths, their challenges, their interests, the existing technology they might have, the environment, where are they having difficulty doing that, that task or that activity? What is the specific task is step number three. And once you've done one, two, and three, and not until you have done that, are you really ready to start looking at potential technology solutions? Don't start with the technology just because it's cool or the newest thing. You really have to make sure that the match is a good one. And the set framework really helps with that. In other words, understand the individual strengths, challenges, and interests. Two, define where the individual is doing the task. Three, define the task that the individual is having difficulty doing. And four, consider borrowing, trying technologies that may help them do the task. We'll talk more about lending libraries a little bit later. So starting with accessibility, places that may need support or modification or places that, that an individual with a mobility impairment might have difficulty with access are uh, private homes, stores and businesses open to the public, schools, healthcare facilities, public transportation and stations, sidewalks and parking lots, government offices and programs, and, and other locations. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most uh, commonly, um, these are the, the type of areas where, where the, the most access problems usually occur. So we've got homes, especially older homes tend to have a lot of steps at the front entrance. Uh, so getting in and out of the front door can be difficult. Um, getting onto and off of public transportation, trains, planes, um, and buses. Um, this also, <clears throat> in some cases, does include uh, taxis. And schools, especially older schools, tend to have lots of steps. And uh, that is a, uh, a barrier to access. Parking lots. Not all parking lots have accessible parking spots or are near uh, curb cuts. Sidewalks, especially transition from the sidewalk to, to a crosswalk. Stores and other um, public locations. And some examples of physical access technologies are ramps. Now there's permanent ramps, which are, are built, added to the structure or to the property, and temporary ramps. There's vertical wheelchair lifts, stair glides, which are those seats that go up and down the stairs. You usually see them in private homes most often, but sometimes public places. Overhead track lifts, Threshold ramps, swing away hinges, accessible doorknobs, transfer boards, shower seats and chairs, elevated toilet seats, toilet armrests. These are all things that can help with physical access. 
And the picture I'm showing here is a, a permanent ramp. That's looks like poured concrete with a hand railing. And this is either some sort of a home or a public building. And um, one thing that you need to pay attention to when you're looking at ramps is they need to have the right angle. They can't be too steep. Generally speaking, that means one in 12. So for every 12 inches of length, the elevation change should be one inch. So if you have a five foot long ramp, <clears throat> the elevation change from the bottom of the ramp to the top of the ramp should be no more than five inches. Because if it's too steep, a person using a manual wheelchair, in other words, if they're pushing their, their wheels, it's gonna to be too difficult or dangerous. So one in 12 is the rule of thumb. Uh, if it's a very long ramp, I believe every 15 feet or 30 feet, there has to be a rest area. I have to double check on that. And ways to improve physical access. You could have uh, curb cuts, <clears throat> which most people are familiar with. Grab bars, typically seen in bathrooms, wide doorways accessible bathrooms and kitchens, accessible parking spots, <clears throat> elevators. You can add elevators to an older building if they don't have any. Um, sometimes they're built either on the outside of the building or, or within a building. Wheelchair accessible tables and desks, accessible water fountains. These are all examples of ways to improve physical access. Oops. So some examples, a temporary ramp. Temporary ramps are common on rental properties because landlords are not always willing to have a permanent ramp built uh, to provide uh, access to, let's say, a front door. But a temporary ramp uh, is a little more palatable to for a lot of property owners. It's also less expensive. They also can be rented. But you want to make sure that it's uh, that it's a good um, manufacturer and a good installer because it still needs to be <clears throat> uh, it needs to be installed in a safe and competent manner so no one gets hurt. But temporary ramps are an alternative to uh, to a permanent ramp. And again, uh, they come in, um, most of them look something like this. Some of them are all aluminum. Some are, um, uh, in this case, black and, and aluminum color. A vertical wheelchair lift. So let's see, let me find my, my laser pointer. So this guy here is the vertical wheelchair lift. Whoops, let's go back. And it's, you know, here's the door. So you're going to go in here, you close the door, you operate the controls, it brings you up to the top. And then there's a door on the back, and you're going to come out onto this landing. Um, so they have outside vertical lifts and indoor ones. Now, the reason that you wouldn't use a ramp here is um, that's probably like a 12 foot, a 12 foot uh, height difference. If you had a ramp, that would be uh, 12 times 12 is 144. That would be 144 foot long ramp. I mean, that's just gigantic. So it wouldn't even make sense to even think about a ramp here. Um, so vertical wheelchair lifts are a common alternative when you don't have enough room for a ramp or if the distance is, is higher. An overhead track lift, uh, this is helpful to transfer people, let's say from bed to the toilet or into the bathroom. Um, and they're typically motorized. Um, they're also set up so potentially a person can operate themselves if they can um, get themselves onto the, the seat of the lift itself. 
height adjustable desks are really important for people that use wheelchairs because wheelchairs are different heights. And if you want to be able to pull up uh, close to the desk, the desktop needs to be slightly higher than the armrests of your wheelchair. So it's important if you're in a location that has people with without. So um, height adjustable desks are important because um, people using a wheelchair and people using a standard chair might want the desk to be at different heights. And they also make different height wheelchairs. Power wheelchairs tend to be a little bit higher. And if you want to be able to pull up to the chair, um, well, the way you want the desk height to be slightly above the armrests. So having height adjustable desks is an important feature for uh, making the environment accessible. And accessible bathrooms, we've all seen accessible bathrooms. They typically have grab bars, uh, lower sinks, sinks you can pull up to. Um, everything is a little bit more within reach from a seated position and they tend to be uh, larger. So there's enough room to turn uh, using a wheelchair. And we'll talk more about some accessibility guidelines for, for bathrooms and, and other uh, public facilities. Uh, door openers, this is really important. I mean, we, we see these in supermarkets, whatnot, but it's also important um, for schools and, and offices so that if someone is using a wheelchair or a walker or canes or crutches, that uh, uh, the door will open uh, with some power assist uh, mechanism. Um, expandable door hinges, this is a nice cheap easy way to get a couple more inches from a doorway. Um, I think you can gain about two inches, one to two inches because it swings the door out of the way and doesn't take up um, clear space in the doorway itself. Elevated toilet seats, a little easier to get up and onto the seat. And uh, another thing that's important is building accessibility doesn't just apply to people with physical disabilities. It's also applicable to people with hearing or visual limitations. So it's important to, to also think about um, people with those types of challenges um, and the uh, ADA accessibility guidelines uh, cover accessibility features for, for people with uh, visual or hearing impairments as well. This can include braille and large print signage, flashing fire alarms, phones and doorbells, large print materials, captioning and descriptive narration for movie theaters and plays, inductive loop technology for those using hearing aids and others. Examples of assistive technology for mobility. Now, before I go on, are there any particular questions about accessibility of, of physical accessibility of, of buildings and other facilities. Right, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Okay, so some examples are crutches, canes, walkers, scooters, wheelchairs, manual power or power assist, wheelchair accessible cars and vans, and exoskeletons. So let's take a look at some of these examples. So walkers, we've all seen walkers. Um, if you know someone who needs a walker, there are a lot of different features to look at. I like walkers that have seats so that if you're using the walker and you need to rest somewhere and there's no chairs, you just flip the seat down and you can sit down and rest. Um, it's also nice to have um, hand brakes and, and there's all different kinds of wheels. There's two wheels with sliders. There's just four sliders. There's all wheels. So there's a lot of different choices. It's good to try different walkers out. And if you need a walker, it's a good idea to consult a physical therapist or a rehab specialist so that you're getting the right thing. Uh, walker baskets, also great. If you have a walker and you need to carry stuff around, uh, put it in the basket. Don't try to hold on to it while you're using the walker. That's just not safe. 
Okay, now power assist wheelchairs are, are kind of interesting. I, I think they're interesting because it's a little bit um, in between uh, a manual wheelchair and a power wheelchair. They also are less expensive than a full power wheelchair, but this is good for someone who can push the wheels somewhat, but they may lack the strength or endurance um, to push up uh, longer hills or to push for longer distance. And a power assist uh, can kind of help out when they get tired or if they're uh, um, encountering um, a, a steep incline. Standing wheelchairs are also kind of a high-end power wheelchair. And they also tend to also uh, include a height. Uh, the seat can go up and down in a seated position, but also to put you in a standing uh, position. This is really great because it enables a person to use a wheelchair to look people in the eye when you're having conversations standing up. It also helps you reach things a lot easier in your environment. And it's also healthy because it, it's good for uh, leg strength, bone strength, circulation, et cetera. So standing wheelchairs are a nice feature, um, but again, something that is more expensive and tends to be an item that's people usually have it covered uh, under their insurance. Adapted vans and cars, all kinds of different ways to adapt a van. Uh, for wheelchair accessibility. Uh, again, you know, you don't want to go into this without help. They're, they're very expensive. There's a lot of choices. So it's good to get help in, in finding the right match uh, for you if you need an accessibility, accessible vehicle. Exoskeletons are basically wearable muscles and support for for people that use wheelchairs but have um, arm strength so it tends to be uh, best for people let's say who are um, have uh, paralysis or um, in lower leg paralysis lower extremity paralysis but they have upper arm upper body strength and this particular woman is using uh, forearm crutches to keep herself upright but the exoskeletons are actually moving her legs and providing the, um, the physical support to keep her uh, standing. So where do you find more information? The first section uh, we're gonna talk about are accessibility guidelines. There are a million accessibility guidelines out there. Sometimes it can get a little bit overwhelming, but I'm just going to show you some that um, that's, I, I think were a good place to start. First is the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, standards for accessible, accessible design. I'm just going to show you some of these websites. So this is the federal government and its information on the standards for accessible design. And there's um, all the details and introduction uh, to the assisted, the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines are in here. It basically tells you the dimensions <clears throat> and uh, the types of equipment you should use to make uh, different types of buildings and, and uh, and uh, sections of buildings accessible to people with disabilities. The Americans, the ADA checklist. This is a nice um, document that helps you. It's a checklist for existing facilities, and it really walks you through everything that you should look for. So it starts, for example, accessible approaches and entrances, and it basically walks you through every single thing that you should check to make sure, for example, ramps. Do all ramps longer than six feet have a railing on both sides? Some people really like checklists, and this is, this is a really good one. Another one is, are, is the width between the railings or curbs at least 36 inches. So basically the guidelines are built into the checklist 
And if you go through this, you, it helps you identify where your accessibility shortfalls may be. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, where I am, we have something called the um, New Jersey Barrier Free Subcode, which is put out by the, the state of New Jersey. And it is the building code for making, um, for new construction, but also for, um, um, but also for renovation, but just trying to get into the, some of the pictures here. Let's see. So here's an idea uh, uh, showing um, ramps, maximum ramp slope, one in 12, what we were talking about before. Uh, let's find some good pictures in here. Oh, this does not have as many diagrams as I was hoping. Okay. Um, I might be in the wrong document, but this is a good place to start. Um, and if you are again are in New Jersey, you and you're doing some new construction or you're renovating something, you have to get a building permit. And you're going to be dealing with your local construction official. And uh, depending on where you live, they may or may not check for to make sure you're following the New Jersey barrier free uh, building code. Um, if not, and depending on where you live, they may say, oh, you know, you have to take care of this or they may look the other way. It's very um, variable uh, on how well the uh, barrier free code is is enforced. Um, Another document is a simple guide to using the ADA standards for accessible design. And whoops, what are we doing here? Okay. And this is uh, put out by the um, an architectural website. And so this is a guide for architects, but it really goes through all the accessibility guidelines and kind of gives you the uh, a place to begin. Okay, moving on to uh, other places to get help for physical access. There's the ADA Technical Assistance Center. There's technical assistance centers all over the country. Uh, for New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, our ADA Technical Assistance Center is in Ithaca, New York, and they are experts in the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you don't know where to begin, but you want to find out, the ADA uh, Center is a great place to begin your process. Um, the U.S. Access Board, another place for Really great information about the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the sponsor uh, of this webinar, the Richard West Assistive Technology Advocacy Center is also a great place to begin. Again, you don't know what to do. You don't know who to talk to. Contact ATAC and they will point you in the right direction. Um, the Community Health Law Project is um, uh, an organization that provides legal services um, to people with disabilities and, and other uh, other groups. And uh, some of the things they do are help with um, accessibility issues. So if you have a, uh, a local store that you think should be accessible and uh, you've asked them to, and uh, or maybe there's a um, there, there's a group that wants to take a legal case against a, 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 a facility because they're not accessible. Uh, organizations like Disability Rights New Jersey or the Community Health Law Project uh, could assist you with, um, it, with legal support. Uh, advancing Opportunities um, is also a good resource for things related to um, accessibility as well as mobility supports. Um, the Job Accommodation Network is a really great resource for um, people with disabilities in work settings or people who are working with them. 
and need support or information about how to make the workplace accessible. So the Job Accommodation Network is, is an excellent resource for that. And private building accessibility contractors. I don't recommend any because I uh, don't know uh, them that well, but if you contact um, ATAC, or advancing opportunities, they should be able to, to point you in the direction of some reputable contractors. And where to get help for AT for Mobility? Well, uh, ATAC runs an assistive technology lending center or funds it, and that lending center is located at advancing opportunities. So if you want to borrow a cane or borrow crutches or um, potentially look at different kinds of mobility technology. The lending center is a place that if they have it, they will lend it to you to try out. So it's a great way to try before you buy. Um, Goodwill Home Medical Equipment is also a program that's funded by um, ATAC and they accept um, used equipment. They refurbish it and they sell it at a deep discount. So if you're looking for um, walking aids or wheelchairs, scooters, equipment for kids, you can search their website, excuse me, to see if they have what you're looking for. And then you can take yourself down to Belmar, New Jersey, uh, in the, uh, the Philadelphia area and uh, go to their showroom and you can actually look at the equipment. Um, then there's also some rehab centers in New Jersey. We have Kessler, we have Children's Specialized Hospital, and there are other rehabilitation facilities in the area. But again, if you're not sure where to begin, sometimes working with um, a wheelchair clinic or a physical therapist or a rehabilitation specialist uh, can be a good way to go in terms of getting guidance and being pointed in the right direction. And that brings us pretty much to the end of our of today's webinar. Um, before we conclude, I just want to let you know that we're running a a drawing for a $25 gift card. We've been having trouble uh, encouraging people to fill out a short questionnaire about the webinar. And so in today's form, Google form, which is down here, if you go in there and, and fill it out, at the bottom of the form is a place to add your email address. And if you add your email address, your name will be entered into a drawing for a $25 gift card. Um, we've had one drawing so far, it's kind of a new, a new thing we're trying out. And, um, I promise that I will only sell your uh, email address to, you know, to Amazon, but really I, I, you know, just a couple, couple stores, I, I promise. Um, but seriously, no, I won't uh, sell your or give away your email address to anybody, but if you win, I will contact you and, uh, and send you the $25 gift card. So please consider taking the survey. It takes about three minutes, put in your email address and get it entered into the drawing. I'll be doing that um, sometime uh, late this week or early next week. And uh, here's all my contact information. And I'm gonna check the chat. You can turn on your microphones at this point. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Uh, can you put in the chat? Okay, so I'm going to put the link. In the chat. Okay. Stop presenting. All right, one minute. Copy. chat and all right so here's the link to the survey 
platform. Uh, let's see, Diane said Universal Design Living Laboratory has a great website. Thank you, Diane. That looks like a good resource. Uh, automatic door openers, the Stanley Company, okay. Uh, and Gail, thank you. I, I did see your email. And a new message, let's see. Do you go to clients' homes to do assessments there even these days? How long does it usually take to get someone to get there for that? Thank you. Um, if you need a evaluation, a home accessibility evaluation, um, I could refer you uh, to an organization. There, there's a number of, of them for, for folks who are receiving services from um, New Jersey DDD. Advancing Opportunities will do uh, home access evaluations. If you uh, send me an email or, or contact uh, Naomi at ATAC, uh, should be able to, um, to help you with that. Um, do you give webinars on adaptive equipment products and how to use them? Uh, yes, if you're interested in a webinar, a specific webinar, a specific topic, um, just send me an email and uh, I'd be happy to, to, con to uh, talk to you about that. Any other questions, comments, uh, either through the chat or use your microphone? Is there funding for much of this? Um, well, it all depends. Uh, there, there, is, there are funding sources depending on the, um, you know, the person's age and and where they're receiving services from. So, for instance, for uh, individuals that are receiving services, adults uh, with developmental disabilities, there is some funding through uh, New Jersey DDD. Um, if you are uh, working or getting ready to work and are involved in the, your state's vocational rehabilitation services agency, there sometimes can be funding through, through voc rehab. Um, sometimes towns or counties will provide like block grant funding to individuals um, to, let's say, to make their home accessible. And um, Often people will go to service organizations or churches or other uh, religious organizations um, for help with funding things like home ramps or, or bathroom remodels. Oh, there's, there's a good point. The VA also may provide help for, for veterans who, who need uh, accessibility supports. Um, there are volunteer organizations as well that, that will do um, home modifications, uh, depending on where you're living. Um, I'm not sure if Habitat for Humanity does, does that, but there are a number of, of service uh, and volunteer organizations that, that will help um, with uh, home modifications in particular. Other questions or comments? Lions Club, yeah, Lions Club, that's a good idea. Uh, rebuilding Together, North Jersey. All right, that sounds like a, um, a, vol a volunteer organization, Rebuilding Together, North yes. Jersey. Great. It's, a, vo it's a volunteer organization, but you have to be financially, you know, in a certain place to um, be able to get help. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, Gail, that's good to know. Do they have a website? Uh, yes, I'll put it in the chat in a second. Thank you. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of times if you need funding, sometimes it, it, it could be as simple as calling your mayor. Because a lot of towns and cities and counties, they have discretionary money. 
And if you live in a particular town and you call your mayor and you say, listen, you know, uh, I, I, I need, I just got, uh, uh, had a car accident. I have to use a wheelchair now. Um, my home isn't not accessible, but I need a ramp. Um, I'm on a fixed income. You know, is there some way that, that you could help out? Um, you never know until you ask. And, and, and like I said, towns and cities do have discretionary money. And sometimes they decide that, yes, they want to, they want to do this to help out one of their, um, their residents. So don't, don't overlook that as a potential uh, funding source. And of course, there's always GoFundMe. Um, you'd be surprised what people, what people use GoFundMe for. All right, so Gail, thank you for the link to Rebuilding Together uh, North Jersey. And any other comments, questions, suggestions? A lot of great ideas here. Um, this webinar will be recorded and I'm assuming that it will also include a, um, a copy of the chat messages so you can you can go back and look and and see uh, information about these uh, different suggestions that everyone's been making